Abuja. And he, I'm quite frankly, he told me that he was going to replicate some of the things. So the point I'm trying to say is that we are really in a very beautiful, well-constructed city, well-planned, uh, relatively well-managed. So all we need to do is to appreciate what we have and really get to open our eyes as we drive around the city and we see how it is so that we really appreciate what we have. Because it's only when you appreciate what you have that then you'll be able to now protect what you have. And I think one of the greatest challenges we have, maybe later in the discussions I would like to share with you, is that we have to own the city. Yes, we have to own the city. It's just beyond saying it's a city created by government. We have to own it, we have to love it, and then we have to fight to protect it. So this is also another road. Uh, it's called the Airport Expressway. It's the Murtala, I mean, Umar Erad, Umar Eradua Expressway. All of you that f come to Abuja by flying in or driving in through the southern axis of this country know what it used to be in 2015, 2016. And in the foreground on this picture on the left-hand side, you will obviously see how it looked like then. This is how it looks like now. It's, it's almost done, it's almost completed. Uh, this, is that, this is the interchange, I believe, at uh, Kuje, going to, going to Kuje. And that particular interchange now, already we are working on an expressway. Uh, it's called the Regional Road 105 that is going to link uh, the, uh, the, ex, the airport expressway right into Kuje town. And this is something that uh, we will not complete, but it's a project we have initiated. It's about 52 billion. Naira, but we are going to make sure that at least some substantial aspect of the work is done before we continue. The next set will come and continue because Abuja is obviously a work in progress. So that's why when we came in, we said we are going to complete what others started, and then now that we've done a reasonable milestone, we now I have initiated a number of projects that we will see later, which we hope those coming later will, uh, will complete. Uh, this is this is what it is, and uh, that's the interchange. It's it's it's, 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 it's such a beautiful. Uh, you can see it by any standard in any part of the world. This is beautiful, but because you are in the car inside it, you or on it, you don't really appreciate. But when we have a you know forum like this, at least you'll be able to appreciate and see what we have. You know, and in the city we have this kind of. Uh, this is Glover something uh, interchange as it is called in quite a number of locations. Uh, so these are, we've done a lot in terms of road network. What I've just showed you actually is just a tip of the iceberg. And that these road networks are not restricted to the city itself. Uh, we've done quite a number of road projects in the satellite towns as well. Uh, we've done a lot of township roads in, in Abaji, for instance. We've opened up many of the roads uh, within the Yaba agricultural area. We've done quite a few in Kubua and Karu and all this, but because time does not permit us, uh, I will not be able to, to show them all here. Now I want to show you what we do. The FCT administration is also saddled, apart from road infrastructure, rail infrastructure, water infrastructure, is also saddled with public buildings. Uh, all the public buildings you see, including this beautiful hall we are in here, were constructed by the FCDA, which is one of the major agencies of the Federal Capital Territory Administration. And now, as time went by and as the city became more mature, uh, a lot of MDS now initiate their own projects. But any public building uh, in this country, I mean in, this, uh, in the FCT, uh, is somehow supervised by the FCDA. We have our engineers. We are, for instance, the director of uh, public building is seated over here. I want to stand up for them to recognize you. Mr. a very foremost builder. And many of them here you are seeing in this hall that are with me are all members of all their various uh, uh, professional institutions at the highest level. Most of them are fellows. For instance, Engineer Hadi Ahmed is uh, a fellow of the Nigerian Society of Engineers. He is the uh, foremost structural engineer in this country and uh, so many of them. So what I want to show is an example of a public building. For those of you who remember Boko Haram, this is the United Nations building that was bombed in 2011. 
we lost about 21 people. You remember. This is the frontage and how it was destroyed. When Mr. President came on board in 2015, uh, he, as part of the briefing, he, he was informed of what happened. And he gave substantial amount of money uh, to the FCT to rebrand, I mean to reconstruct that building. And to the glory of God, the United Nations has, building has been reconstructed. Uh, now it's functional and all the agencies of the United uh, Nations in Nigeria, headquartered in Abuja, all stayed there. And also, uh, the immediate past coordinator of the UN in Nigeria told me that apart from their building in New York, in the entire globe, they don't have any other building that is as beautiful as the one in Abuja. And all this was paid for by the government of Nigeria, constructed uh, by a Nigerian registered company, and of course provided, supervised by the FCT. So I think this is something that I personally feel very proud because I, the, the reconstruction of this building was done during my tenure, and I have had cause to visit the building severally uh, while it was being reconstructed, and of course after. This is just one aspect of the public building, uh, and it's all, uh, you know, and then another one I uh, probably would like to show you, it's, uh, this is uh, the south, this is what we call the extension of the Inner Southern Expressway. Uh, I think that is uh, the one that eventually will link up uh, to the Galadima axis. This is what it, it was when we came in at the top portion, and this is how it looks like now. It's just a pity that these pictures, I cannot, you know, expand them so that you could see. But uh, we have, you know, some of these. That's how it is. And you can see it's all done. If we had not done this, you can imagine how movement within the city would have been. Uh, and then this, this is how it is. You look at it. So beautiful. Look at the vehicles moving. Look at how it is. Now what we are trying to do is the interchange uh, on both sides, as you can see. We'll, we are going to green them. And then uh, it's, it becomes something that everybody will feel proud of, and I'm sure you also are very proud of. Uh, um, and then uh, these are, this is what we call, of course, I've shown you this before. It's basically how it was. It was basically only the pillars were there. And now this is how you can see the bridge work after. And we are continuing on this project. This is, I believe, around the Apo Eta Change. On the right-hand side is Namdi Azukwe, expressway I believe uh, in the background there is the symmetry uh, and then you can see I mean when we came in there was nothing there this is still under construction this is the road we intend to continue it will pass through the upper mechanic village and terminates or rather take a pause around the Wasa junction about 15 kilometers down the road this is something we are doing and those of you coming from the upper axis from the uh, Oladipodia axis of, uh, uh, of that part of Apo, I'm sure you, you will, you're very happy with it. I mean, this is all being done quietly, without noise. You know, you can see it. And ultimately, it's, 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 you know, you will see. And this is a project. <laughs> so uh, this is a project, if, my, if I might, uh, okay. This is a project that uh, ultimately is going to be part of a 65-kilometer road network that is going to be 10 lanes. That's the master plan. And it's, it's going to start from the Ring Road 1, which is called Namdi Azukwe Expressway, right through to it will join the junction at uh, Ring Road uh, 2, and thereafter will join the junction at uh, S30, which is the one going through the medical city, which is under construction. Ultimately, this road will bust out in Guagualada. For those of you who drive on the Abuja Lokoja Expressway, immediately after you pass Guagualada City, you will see a hanging bridge. And you begin to wonder why is government just creating a hanging bridge. So that's how the city is being planned. Uh, at the time that uh, 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 Lokoja Expressway was being constructed, uh, the administration told them that there was going to be a road that was going to come in there. So that's why we decided to build that bridge so that subsequently when the road comes there, you don't need to start breaking the Abuja 
local expressway to be able to create the bridge. And that's how the system is. Ultimately, the, the, road, from, the road from Apo is going to pass through Wasa, and then it will go right through. And it's going to open up the entire stretch of land between that part of the city, which is called Abuja South, and the entire area of Pegi, Kuji, and all these places. And this is where your, uh, the Abuja is going to grow in future. And that's the beauty of the Abuja Master Plan. It's a, it's a document that is, uh, has, has looked very far into the future. And that's what we've been trying to do. And that's why you begin to now understand why the FCT administration under my tenure and, of course, the leadership of Mr. President have concentrated in trying to finish with the city center and then we gradually move out in cycles. And that is how the plan is, you know, uh, incremental development that takes into account the city as it grows, I mean, uh, geographically and, of course, uh, demographically. Uh, this is, these are some of it. You, you, you just see it. Uh, and this is another, yeah, this is the Southern Parkway, one of the most beautiful arterial roads in the city. The parkway system starts from Mabushi, in fact, from the uh, Life Camp roundabout, right through to through Mabushi uh, into Wuse, and then you move over into Garki, and then you bust out in Kaura District. Uh, this is something that uh, I don't know if anybody works from, for NTA here. Yeah, for those of you who work in NTA, uh, you know what NTA, how it was for you to get access to NTA in 2015. It was all laterite. All access, there was no access. You had to go, if you were to go through the CBN side on the list, this left-hand side, you had to go through a ditch and you had to, you know, meander yourself. And if you have to go through this other side, but look at how it looks like. This is the parkway now, on the right and the left-hand side. This was all done by the FCD, I mean FCT administration during uh, the tenure of uh, President Mohamed Buhari. And you can see how it is now. It's such a beautiful place. And now it's a one-way traffic. And that's why initially when we had to stop people going against the traffic, they just couldn't understand why it was. But that's the whole idea. So that it's a, you have to go right through Eradua Center. It's a big loop. You look at the er Eradua Center loop, you go right through past the National Mosque uh, on the left-hand side and then reach the Christian Center and then, of course, past the CBN and then you are across two major bridges that we constru constructed uh, during this administration and then you go right through to the uh, FCDA complex, uh, which I think I'd like you to see once more. Uh, and then uh, that's it, and then it's, it's going to proceed. Actually, after the FCDA complex, complex, the first bridge, which we did, I mean, and all these are double carriageway bridges, is the one that is across uh, Muhammad Buhari Way, and then the next bridge, which we've also completed, is across uh, Ramson Kuti, and thereafter the third one is going to be over Namdi Azukwe Expressway, and then you go into Kaura District. And what you are seeing now in the center, is the big quadrangle uh, that has the FCDF facilities, and then on the, at the upper portion is the Abuja Property Development uh, uh, Company, one of our subsidiaries' headquarters, which we also completed. Uh, these are all some of the parkway developments, you know, you know, from high altitude. And this is another major project we are working on. This is Galadimawa Expressway. On the right-hand side in the f foreground over there is the National Stadium facilities. On the left -hand side, as you proceed, is the Gaines Village. As you can see, the side, uh, the side roads have already been completed. This is the major this, uh, area one. No, not, uh, it's, yeah, it's the major roundabout. This road is the one that is going to link Goodluck, Ebele, Jonathan, right through to Galadimawa. The bridge has been done. As you can see, uh, a lot of work has been done. This is the road project that I think we should be able to deliver, God willing, by 29th May 2023. <laughs> so as you can see it, and uh, you can even notice when you go there now that diversions have been created so that they can continue. This aspect of the road has not been completed. 
but the one further down as you go towards the American uh, Technical University, uh, you will uh, near the roundabout that takes you into Galadima by the left hand side, you will see that the carriageways in the center have already been completed. This is a major project also. Ultimately, it's going to link up with the road that I mentioned to you that is going through the medical city. It's called the S30 now. Uh, we've not named it. Maybe one of you will get the name. If, I don't know. Uh, so, we, we, so that's our intention. But ultimately, this one will also go and bust out near the airport. It's going to link up with Ring Road 2, and thereafter will also link up with Ring Road 3. Uh, and these are some of the things we've done. Uh, we've done a lot of work also in the central area. Uh, this you can see. Uh, in the central area, we have basically two major arterial roads. They are called the Independence Avenue and then the uh, Const uh, Constitution Avenue. Technically, we call them B6, B12, and the Cycle Road. That is the road that, if you take a look at it as a circular road, is the one that uh, comes from the State House here, Villa, right through the Federal Secretariat up to Moshul Abiola Stadium, and then you take a loop, and then you come back through the National Hospital, right through the diplomatic quarters. Most people in Abuja never knew that these roads were meant to be multiple uh, usage on both in and out. Uh, and I think when we came in, for those of you who have been here for quite some time, you realize that only one lane was being used. But you will see so many hanging bridges. What we have done over the last few years of my, uh, my being in the FCT, of course with the team behind me, was to complete the portion on the Federal Secretariat side. Now it's, it's double traffic uh, passing through, uh, of course that's the, that's, the Kostya, that's the Abuja Towers on the right. And then on the left is the Kolcharis building. Uh, on the extreme right is the Abuja Metro Station, as you can see. This is how it is. It's all been completed now. So now you could use it to go into the diplomatic quarters around the Russian embassy, and then you proceed up to the EU compound and then some of the other diplomatic facilities there. Uh, this is also a very major road that we intend to complete. If you go now, you find that behind the British embassy and the American near the American Embassy, you will notice that all the work is being done. This is uh, what we call central area redevelopment. This is a major project that has been on and on probably for the last 10 years, more than 10 years. But what we did as an administration, as a matter of fact, was one of the roads that we started on. And I think, uh, I'm, I'm sure we, we are all very pleased with it because that's the main entry point into the city. Uh, this is what we have completed, and you look at the loop there, and if, if you look at the map of Abuja, that's really the heart of the city. Yeah, this is all part of it. You can see how it is now, the way it is now. It's Constitution Avenue, it's, and of course we have, these are the buildings, just look at it. But whilst, once you're on the street, you, you don't appreciate what you have. But with these pic pictures, I'm sure now we all feel very proud, and I'm sure all the bashing that the FCT minister gets once in a while in the press, <laughs> especially from some of my friends who are not here. Uh, it's, I mean, you can understand, you know, but look at us. I mean, tell me, how many African countries have this kind of network of roads? Exactly. So that's why we have to own the city. This is my, if for anything, if there's anything I want to convey after this brief, briefing, is that we have to own the city, we have to be patriotic, we have to appreciate what we have. Because if you don't appreciate what you have, you will never protect what you have. So these are some of the things. And in addition to that, uh, we have a couple of developments we are doing. This is the, the city is planned in such a way that you have a series of ring roads. The first ring road, called Ring Road 1, is Namdi Azikwe, which starts from the Katampe Hills and terminates at the Villa uh, Apo Roundabout. And then the next one is Ring Rock 2. That's the one that starts from uh, going to Kapitape District proper, and you pass through uh, um, Jahi on the left hand side and Guarimpa on the right hand side. You bust out around the Life Camp Major Roundabout. You go through uh, Mbora District, and then you bust out 
uh, you pass the institutional district, and then you bust out on the airport express. We are at the junction of the Na Judicial Institute. From there, it continues right through uh, to towards the Games Village and goes to the Galadima Axis and bust out at uh, Wasa. So after that, we have Ring Road 3. Ring Road 3, if you go around Day Day area, you'll see Hanging Bridge also. So that Hanging Bridge is meant to be part of Ring Road 3, and then we have Ring Road 4 as well. All these are planned roads, some of which we have started. For instance, we have commenced the construction of the Ring Road uh, 3, which starts from the Day Day area, will pass through Karsana and uh, Kagini, this, yeah, Karsana district, and go towards the airport and even beyond. So this is all in preparation for the massive influx of people that we have been seeing. And as you all know, it has already been uh, officially uh, indicated by a lot of agencies that Abuja is one of the fastest growing cities in Africa. And uh, urbanization is a reality. Uh, by 2050, we are told about 70% of the world's population would be living in cities. So that's why whatever we do, we are planning for the future. Uh, of course, the resources have been an issue, but within the available resources, I'm sure you can see that uh, with all modesty, we have done marvelously well during the last few years. So these are some of the, and of course, bef once you start a road network, you start by create, doing the bridges. And these are the pillars for the bridges. And then uh, you will see some of the other aspects. Uh, this, this, is, uh, this is also a road that we initiated. Uh, dualization of the lower Osuma to Gurara Road. It's about 75 kilometers. This is what it was in 2015, and this is what it is today. It's not been completed, but this is a road I think we are working towards completing maybe sometime end of this year or early first quarter of next year. And uh, it gives, uh, first and foremost, this particular road has three advantages. As you know, the lower Osuma Dam that provides water to Abuja and its environs up to Gwagalada, uh, is also connected with an interbasin transfer pipe that brings water during the peak of the dry season from uh, Gurara in Kruna State. That's 75 kilometers. And these pipes are so huge that all of us will be in the pipe and be standing. We will still not be able to reach the top. It's about 1.5 1, 1 meters in diameter. So uh, that was why the road was built. But as time went by, uh, that place became a very important agricultural zone and also a very important arterial road that links Kaduna State to the FCT. So that's why, and this is one of the, the beauty of the President Muhammad Buhari administration. We made a case that this road starts from the FCT, transverses a portion of Niger State, and then also terminates in Kaduna State. Uh, the portion in the FCT is about 22 kilometers. Niger State, I guess, uh, maybe about 18 or so, and thereafter it balanced in, uh, in Kaduna State. So we made a case, and Mr. President gave us funding for it, and they are working. And for those of you who live in Buari, you will realize that because of this road now, the entire economic, you know, uh, the economic environment of Buari has changed. Because now, you can stay in Buari and passing through the road that we rehabilitated and do an allergy, you can be in the city center within 30 minutes. And all the property values in that area have increased. And this is the road. And, and so that's the whole uh, essence of develop, you know, concentrating on infrastructure. Because infrastructure is an enabler. And that's why when you notice that certain aspects of the FCT probably are not requiring the required attention. It's because when you have to deploy resources, you have to, you have to prioritize. And because infrastructure development is such an enabler uh, of economic and social activity, so that is why we decided that as an administration, since government is a continuum, as an administration, we decided that we'll just concentrate on infrastructure so that uh, then uh, subsequent uh, teams will come and build upon. Because without this infrastructure, and looking at the population explosion in the territory, uh, I think uh, all the reasons why we left Lagos uh, to come back to Abuja would have hit us. So this is how it looks like. It's still under construction. 
uh, but I think this is a project also that we intend to deliver by the grace of God before we leave. Yeah, this is also another expansion that we are doing in the diplomatic quarters. Uh, we have uh, Guzape 2, Guzape 3, and uh, these are all works that are ongoing. Uh, and they, it all looks bushy and so on, but give another couple of months or a couple of years, it will just become a full-fledged district. Okay, that's... Uh, okay. Also, as I earlier mentioned to you, the master plan of the uh, Abuja, especially the federal capital city, has created what we call districts. Every district is supposed to be a holistic environment uh, that takes care of the residents there. Uh, there are school, there are places of worship, there are security places, fire services, residences, and commercial places. And that's how you have, uh, of course, initially we had Garki, later you had Wuse, you had Metama 1, Metama 2, you have Asokoro, and then all the other districts. And, and that's how it is. Now what we are doing is, if you notice, we had major arterial roads, but there were no direct linkages between one district to the other. So that's why at Uye now, you will notice that we are now linking up uh, Olshego Obasanjo Way uh, on Wuse uh, with Uye District. And this is the massive bridge that is under construction across Namdi uh, Azikwe Expressway, which is called Ring Road 1. And the whole idea is now, uh, instead of the person living in Uye, to either go to the stadium interchange to be able to hit the city center, or to go to what we call the beggar runabout, to be able to enter the city center. All the person needs to do now is just to cross this bridge. And this is a bridge that the, uh, the engineers have told me that we should be able probably to deliver by, by Christmas this year or early next year. And this is what we are doing. And then a similar bridge is now being constructed at what we call the powerhouse junction. That's the one that links this part of Asokoro that we live in uh, on uh, Yakubu Gawangwe with the other part of Asokoro. Once that is done, then this uh, uh, gridlock that you sometimes you find at the intersection would have been over. So these are all, and this is how the city has been planned. You, you, you create additional infrastructure to match the needs of the city. And this is something that uh, is being done, and I encourage you to just go there and see. This is the overall picture. Uh, at the extreme end there is Wuse District on the foreground, which is not shown, is Wuye District. And you can see how they're doing the work. And we are doing it in such a way that as much as possible, there is minimum disruption to traffic. Uh, and this is it because most of the contractors are well tested. And of course, the engineers have done this for the last 30 years, so they are very composite. And I'm very happy that uh, the Director of Engineering Services, uh, Engineer Obiora, is here with us, a veteran of the city. And I think we need to clap for him. So these are, I guess, uh, apart from road infrastructure, we have what we call district infrastructure. Every district, for you to finish a district, for people to start accessing their plots and building, you have what we call the district infrastructure. And this is the network of roads within the district. And apart from that, we have what we call the underground cadastra. That is the network of water system pipes and foul water system pipes, sewage pipes, telecommunication ducts, uh, uh, electrical cables. All these are done. And sometimes it takes you probably more time to do the underground cadastral before you are able to do the road itself. And this is Jahi District. It's been under construction. Jahi District is that district that is, you know, tucked in between Mobushi and Guarimpa. The lot of work has been done there. I think it's probably around 50 to 60 percent completion. When we came in, not much work has been done, but we've been able to put in uh, reasonably good money there, and there's a lot of work there. Uh, so this, by the same token, some of these districts are under development. So apart from the road infrastructure, that is the major arterial road infrastructure. We also have the internal network of roads within the districts. And each district is managed by a district engineer with a complement of staff. Uh, this is uh, Apple Estate. This is how it was when we came in. You can see it, it was all laterite. 
and this is what it, it is today. And each time you, you asphalt a road, automatically the, 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 the environment there becomes more habitable, and then, of course, property values go up and so on. And that's probably one of the reasons why you see investments in Abuja. Uh, I think there was a report that says uh, the number one destination for investment now in Nigeria is Abuja, because people make good money here. Uh, this is a, uh, okay, this is a, we call it a tier road S30. It's a road that links the mass housing estates. Uh, this is what it was when we came in. This is what it is today. If I get another opportunity to, to make a presentation to you, I want to, I'll come and explain to you the entire concept of mass housing, what we are doing, and I'm also going to show you what we are doing in the medical city. Already, Afri Exim Bank, which is a very important African uh, multilateral financial institution, is building a 500-bed international hospital that is going to cater for not just Nigeria, but uh, West Africa. The first phase is, the first phase is uh, about 200 beds, and then subsequently they are going to upscale it. The NMPC is also going to put up a hospital there, and then uh, this road already, it's a dual carriageway. We've done one, aspect, one side of the carriageway, and we are working on, you can see it here on the foreground, and then on the left side is the second part of the carriageway, which we are going to work on uh, at a funding permission. And ultimately, Amadou Belloway, uh, which is the one that uh, is on the other side of Eagle Square, is going to go right, of course, passes through Apo, as it is now, then it's going to bust out and come and link up with this uh, S30. So that's how it is planned. But this is something probably that will be done uh, in another few years to come. And S30, like I told you, is going to link up with the Galadimawa Expressway, and then uh, they are going to all link up to a very major expressway that is going to bust out uh, across Ring Road 3 and then ultimately Ring Road 4. This is how the road is. You can see the entire road corridor on the left-hand side has already been cleared, but work has not started, but this is the road the way it is now. Uh, this is the junction at a place called, I think, Wumba. Uh, these, some of these settlements, of course, will have to go eventually, but you can see how the road is. And then by the left is an area uh, that uh, it's called Malaysian Garden, which is also a residential area that has some challenges, but we are trying to resolve. And then, of course, another infrastructure work we've done has to deal with the Abuja, right, uh, Abuja Rail Mass transfers, uh, Transit. It's a project we inherited that was about 52% uh, completion. We spent in a lot of money, completed it, uh, brought in the, the, locom the wagons that will run the system, uh, opened up about three stations, and now we intend to open another four stations. That's the command and control center. All this is functional. Due to COVID-19, we had to stop operations because, as you know, the light rail system is a system of rail that basically cramps people to move them within short distances. And most of the time, you find that there are people who are you stand, you have to stand. Sitting seats are very limited. And so if you stand also, it becomes almost impossible to be able to adhere to COVID-19 protocols. That's one of the main reasons. I've seen in the popular press a lot of issues regarding why is it not working and so on. The reality is uh, it's better to save lives than just to say you want to run the rail system. But we are working towards uh, resuming uh, operations very soon. Uh, of course, these are all part of, uh, this is also some of the developments in the satellite towns. Uh, these are the bridges uh, infrastructure in Kubua town. Uh, these are, this is Wasa affordable housing. They are all in the outskirts of the city. Uh, and this is uh, Buari district infrastructure, which we are working on also. Uh, and this, uh, this is the water supply. Part of the infrastructure work we have been doing also includes water supply. Karshi is a major satellite town. This is an earth dam that we found that was under construction. Added to the earth dam also is supposed to be a water treatment plant. It was grossly underfunded before we came in, but now we are funding it very well. And I think we should be able to reach completion before we leave in 20, uh, 2023. <laughs> and then, of course, all what I've shown you 
are projects that we inherited and we decided to complete them. Because without doing so, it, it would have just amounted to waste of resources. Because any project, even if it were 95% done, as long as you don't finish that 5% remaining, you will not get the utility and the benefit of that project. And that is why we, we did that. And that's why after reaching some reasonable milestone, we decided also to initiate some other new projects, which even if we do not complete them, since government is a continuum, whoever comes in after us will probably will also naturally just continue. And these are some of the few that I will show you, but we have numerous of them, actually, not many. Uh, of course, uh, when we came in, we realized that the interchange going into the airport was creating a lot of gridlock and also a lot of unnecessary jamming for those who want to proceed towards University of Abuja and then the Lokoja Expressway, and those who want to make a right turn to go into the airport. So, and that's why we had to put a bridge there. And then, of course, we realized also this major arterial road into the city from the airport had failed because it was constructed over 30 years ago as the main road into the city of Abuja. Uh, from if you come from the airport. And we just resurfaced the whole road, but we did it in such a way that there was minimal uh, disruption. And we did it in such a way that we made sure that as much as possible, 95% of all the trees that were lining that road were not affected. And I think it was well done. And I, I think I, we all feel very happy. But naturally, we all pass through the road and we forget what it used to be, you know. But that's how life is. Uh, it was, uh, and, and this is another road that we, 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 this is how it was before, and this is what it is now. These are, these are just, this is the aspect of the Ring Road 3 that I was telling you. This is a road that most people don't even get to know about it. But if you are to go to the Idu station, as you reach the junction uh, around a road called Nama Disambo, one uh, on the right hand side you go to Nizemia hospital on the left you go towards the sta railway station at Idu. you will see some road work in front of you but you don't go there because it's all around some cashew trees but that is really the ring road three in the making and it's also going to be a road that is going to link to the left to our abuja industrial zone and then it's going to continue to open up that area work is being done gradually but of course this will take time but by the time it's done it's going to be exactly like what you see uh, on Namdi Azikwe Expressway. I see this is some portion of the road that normally, the, if a road is like six or ten lanes, we start with the service lane. That way you allow people to walk because normally the road will be in an area that is not, well, is not very heavily populated naturally. So you start working on it and it allows the construction uh, companies to be able to move equipment and so on. Gradually, you open what we call the road, entire road corridor. And then you start moving villages or people who are on the road corridor. These things take time. Uh, but then you do it gradually. And then as time goes by, then you're able to expand. And this is really what is happening. And along the area where you have waterways or marshland, you start building the bridges. And that's why in many parts of Abuja, you will see what we call hanging bridges. You do that so that later when it comes, you, all you need to do is just to interconnect them through a network that has already been planned. Uh, this has, I think I've shown you this. These are the United Nations building. Uh, yeah, in the satellite towns, we've tried to s see if we could uh, introduce solar lights for some of these roads. I think this is uh, along Karshi Road. Some we've done, some we've not completed, but we intend to continue. And like I told you, really Abuja, as a federal capital city, is basically work in progress. Uh, we've also done a number of new projects. This is a, a road we have undertaken uh, to the NCDC headquarters at Gadwa. Uh, we felt that because at the time of that, I mean, the staff and everybody, including those donor agencies, we are always passing this road at night 24-7, and we felt that we really needed to do it. And uh, Mr. President, when we approached him, provided 100% funding for it. And now the road is done, including uh, uh, street lights and so on, you know. So, and this is, uh, this is uh, 
the, and also, uh, of course, while we were doing the road, we realized that the Nigeria Medical and Dental Council had an office there, and so we just did a spore of about 500 meters into the office because it was all to complement our fight against COVID-19. And then uh, we converted, uh, this is uh, at the background there is the Command and Control Center for the Abuja Light Rail. In the foreground is what we call the training facility. Uh, the Abuja Light Rail system is meant to be in six lots, covering a, period, a, a distance of about 300 kilometers, all standard gauge double track. But so far we've done about 88 kilometers, uh, standard gauge double track, uh, under lot three and one A. So this is meant to be the training center for all those that will, because railway is going to be a huge industry here, a huge employer, employer of labor, and more importantly, an enabler of economic development. Uh, so that's why all this was planned so that as the lots are being constructed, then the facilities to cater for the staff and also people will be done and eventually we want to to make Abuja a, uh, a training hub for the Nigeria railway system because if you look at the master plan of the railway in Nigeria Abuja is in in the center where the, the 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 lines that will come from the central line which comes from Wari up to Tape and then uh, Jakuta into Abuja and then the line from Mina the line from Kano Kaduna will all eventually terminate here both for passengers and for cargo and that's why we are positioning the city to be able to be a center of excellence for this kind of services. Uh, this is, uh, of course, uh, this of some of this. We, we used an example of the Gosa West Dump site, where a lot of heavy, heavy duty trucks convey the daily solid waste from the city into the west side where it is recycled. And then we said, okay, we decided to construct a road there using 100% concrete. And this is what you have, it's a rigid concrete road. You can see it uh, finally completed at the last picture on the lower portion on the right hand side. And we just tried it so that we could cost it properly. And the dual objective of course was to make it basically a permanent road because it's heavy duty traffic there. And part of the road, especially in the rainy season had issues but ultimately also for us to see what the economics are going to be in respect of using concrete roads so that in some of our developments in the future we might want to use concrete and i think it has come up very well and for this for this particular project also uh, we got funding from uh, the the federal government other things we've done uh, of course is to 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 to, to repair some roads in some of the areas where we have facilities you know uh, you can see them here. Uh, these are some of the roads we've pre repaired and done. Uh, these are all some of the roads I earlier mentioned. Uh, now what we are gradually doing in the city is because we have already keyed in as part of the partner world cities that uh, I believe in, uh, in the fact that we want to be part of the global movement to reduce carbon emissions. We've, and of course, Abuja even conceptually was meant to be 40% green. And so we, we pride ourselves as a green city. And part of the areas where we are trying to, to key in is to now gradually go use renewable energy for our power source. Many of our facilities now use solar. And now as time goes by, maybe subsequent administration, we intend to create mini grids that will use gas and then will use solar power and luckily for us Abuja is in a geographical part of Nigeria where the intensity of the radiation from the sunlight is such that it's able to give us sustainable solar power and what we have started doing is to retrofit some of our streets uh, street lights with solar as you can see and some of the other roads that are in the other you know back ends of the city we are trying to use uh, uh, solar, but it's going to be a gradual process. So this is some of what you are seeing here. And also we want to leverage on the fact that the AKK pipeline that is moving from Ajakuta uh, through Abuja, Kaduna to Kano, uh, when energized, we want to also be part of it. And that's why now we are working on the Abuja gas master plan uh, so that uh, eventually 
we'll use uh, LPG for power firing our mini grids, and then more importantly also, it will be piped to households for domestic use. Uh, these are all some of the other projects we initiated, uh, and uh, I think I, I don't need to bore you with them. I just now want to tell you of what we are doing in the water. Abuja is served with portable water by the Lower Osuma Dam, whose capacity is over 1 billion cubic meters of water. And we have enough water there, and we have uh, treated water in the two major treatment plants that is able to provide water for the entire uh, Abuja for the next decade. And more importantly, because of the interbasin transfer pipeline from Gurarada, uh, to lower Osuma, then for all intents and purposes, water is not a problem for us. But the main challenge is how to reticulate the water. When we came in, statistics show that only 30% of that water gets to the residents because many parts of the city are not reticulated, especially those that in other phases, particularly phase three and phase four of the city. So that's why this administration uh, initiated what we call the Abuja Greater Water uh, Master Plan and you know and all these pictures you are seeing here that shows you the areas that will be covered and I think we are talking of a total of about seven additional districts will all be covered by water and if you notice now you will see that in uh, Ring Road on Ring Road 1 around the, the Guarimpa area and also on the area around the Apo you will see massive pipes being laid this is all part of the project. Uh, the laying of the pipes will be completed by early next year. Uh, but the reticulation will, will continue, uh, of course, uh, subsequently. Ultimately, when once that is done, the entire area you are seeing that is marked in orange, uh, blue, light blue, and dark blue will all be covered with reticulated water that is treated from lower Osuma Dam. This is one major project running into billions that we're also very proud of as part of the infrastructure project we have initiated. You can see the pipes are being laid. The entire I mean, route for the pipe has been identified. Compensation is being paid where appropriate. And as you can see how they're doing it quietly without making too much noise. Uh, this is, uh, yeah, these are all additional works, uh, which is, aha, uh -huh. this is a road that we feel we, we will try to con connect it. Uh, if you look at the Woodlock Ebele Jonathan, terminates now at the junction of Herbert Macaulay. Uh, at the junction of Herbert Macaulay Way, just, uh, you see the CBM by the right. But that road is supposed to continue right behind the diplomatic quarters going into that massive runabout at, uh, at Garki, which will eventually go into Galadima. It's under construction. We'll try to achieve some good milestone before we, we move on. I'll just quickly continue and finalize because I noticed that uh, yeah, this is Gusapetu under, under construction. It's going to be a massive residential district, which uh, we've commenced, and I think subsequent administrations will come and continue. Uh, and then uh, some of the public buildings we are doing, of course, is to, we are rehabilitating the federal secretariat. The last work done there was over 30 years. We have already contractors have mobilized are working on it. Uh, we are rehabilitating the National Assembly. Uh, this is the dome of the National Assembly. The rehabilitation in the National Assembly involves the electromechanical as well as civil works. Electromechanicals involves the entire lifts and electrical system, including the fire service system, uh, public address system, and even the seating arrangement is going to be changed into something more modern uh, in line with you know, modern parliaments. I mean, not to forget that this was initially done in 1999. So what we are generally doing is that, uh, for all intents and purposes, Abuja has now matured. So as you mature, you get illnesses of maturity. So now we are trying to see that uh, we, we, that's why many of the roads now, we are rehabilitating them, and many of the major public buildings, we are also working on them. And that's the way you do. You have to continue to maintain. 
maintenance is key, and this is some of the, uh, apart from building on infrastructure, we are also maintaining them. And then uh, these are some of the things. And also, the Christian Center uh, is also a very important public edifice. Uh, this administration, uh, with my team, realized that the National Mosque and the Christian Center, even though not owned by government, but are very important critical monuments of the city of Abuja. Each time we get visitors, we take them there. Whenever we want to pray, either against COVID or on Independence Day <laughs> or whatever, we go there. So that's why, as a deliberate policy, we now put in our budget uh, resources for us to have rehabilitate the Christian Center and also rehabilitate the National Mosque. Because even though we don't own them, but I mean we use them, and it's there, these are edifices that we all feel proud in the city. And this is something we are doing, it, and uh, all this is being done by my colleagues from the Federal Capital uh, City Development Authority. This is the Christian Center. When you go there, you will notice that the entire uh, cladding on the roof has been removed, and we are working on it. And uh, uh, so these are some of the, I, I think I wanted to show you the one for the uh, National Mosque also, but somehow it's not here. Uh, basically, I could go on and on, quite frankly, because just to show you that uh, in our own unique way uh, of working, this is what we've been able to achieve. And what I've showed you is a tip of the iceberg. And maybe since this is an opportunity, I want to probably also use this opportunity to, to tell you some of the salient things we've done. What we've tried to do is, during the last few years of my administration is to empower the institutions that run the city. And I deliberately try to de demystify the office of minister <laughs> and allowed agencies to work. Because what I've realized is people overblow the office of the minister and by the time a minister comes in, he comes in or she comes in with her own mindset and the moment they go, they carry everything away, and there is no institutionalization. And then you find that sustainability becomes a challenge. And this is what I faced, we found that, and uh, we did a lot of studies on it, and we said, no, we have to demystify the office of the minister, and then empower all the agencies to do their work. In the past now, ministers in the FCT were judged by the number of buildings they demolished. Is that not so? So when I came in, I said, no, I was not going to demolish because I've been issue, if institutions that were meant to do their work had worked properly with free hand, then a building would not even come up for it to be demolished. And that's why I spent substantial part of my first tenure to empower the institutions. And now demolishment, demolishing of buildings is no longer an issue. As a matter of fact, they don't even tell me. I just say, go and do your work. That's why you are employed. As long, but the only caveat I say is, make sure you are on the right side of the law. So having said that, thank you very much for listening to me. I think, I think the Honorable Minister deserves another round of applause. All right, well, while we allow the Honorable Minister to settle down, thank you. While we allow the Honorable Minister to settle down, um, we will take the questions, but uh, the number of questions we're getting online, I don't think we've gotten that number of questions uh, <laughs> since we started the State House briefing. Now, this is the 40th session. The number of questions online is just uh, out of the world. So we'll get to the questions online, but first of all, we'll take the immediate constituency here. And as I can see that almost all the hands are raised. So, <laughs> Prime Minister, Acting Chair, with your permission, I think we might need to do five questions for one session instead of the normal four that we do. But as much as possible, oh my God, one question each. We have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve. 
Okay, we'll take five questions, but please let's try and harmonize our questions. Five questions, but let's make sure it's just one question each. I'll start with uh, Punch, two, Anthony, three, Harry, four, John Bosco, five. For the first set, please. I'll get back to everybody. Oh. Ah, but we have, we have almost five women at the back. But usually we say gentlemen of the press. Don't worry. We'll make sure that they, all the questions are answered. Uche, next set will be all women. Next set. The chair says next set will be all women. <laughs> all right. Stephen. Remember one question, please. Good morning, Honorable Minister. Good morning, everyone. My name is Stephen Angbulu. I write for the Punch newspapers. And I must commend the good work you're doing. And it's very evident, particularly about the solar-powered street lights, some of which I saw were being you know, raised up somewhere around Idu this morning. And even the, um, the water infrastructure pipe along the ring road, like you said, we've seen them several months, and work is ongoing there. It's commendable. Thank you very much. My question is um, about the, you recently suspended the inauguration of council chairman and councillors a day to the event, and you cited a court judgment. You were joined in the case while INEC and PDP were excluded. Now, this has fueled speculations that uh, you were involved in the process because of uh, the way the election went um, to the favor of the, the main opposition. These are speculations. And the, as part of the statement your office issued on the, on, on the issue, uh, on the postponement or the suspension of the inauguration, you said that while complying, we're also making efforts to vacate the judgment and if the need arises to appeal the judgment so that the correct position of the law will be determined by the legal processes. How far have you gone with this? Thank you. Good morning. Good morning, Honorable Minister. My name is Abdul Qadir Yakasei for Express News. Sir, uh, security is a grand challenge now in Nigeria. Uh, for the uncomplete building, it's a place where some crimes have been planned, planned here. What's your demonstration done for this? Thank you. Thank you, Honorable Minister. My name is Tony Aileme. I write for Business Day. Um, one of the major issues going forward is the issue of uh, ensuring sustainability. And before you can ensure sustainability, you need to have adequate revenue to sustain what you are putting in place. Uh, what are you doing about internally generated revenue to ensure that um, your administration is also able to continue to maintain your projects? Good afternoon, Honorable Minister. My name is Harry Awurumi, but I write for Prompt News. Well, um, before my question, I have to commend you and commend your principal, it is the President of the Federal Republic of Nigeria, for his policy of continuity. Um, I live down a poor mechanic village, Kabusa, so I can be a good um, um, witness to the road constructions that are coming there and the developments that are coming there. Yeah, because some of us who probably the master plan of Abuja did not envisage that as we walk in the city center that um, we are not going to be opportune to live in the city centre, but the at the asket. So I thank you and I thank the uh, president, you know, for the good 
work he's doing through you. Then now my question is, uh, you mentioned that, um, yes, the former ministers before you, one in particular was known for how many houses that were demolished and that during your own era, you know, could you have up to one year now to conclude that um, houses are not being demolished. Honorable Minister, probably those of us in the media know that of late, your name or the name of Ekaro Atta has been associated with the demolitions going on in Abuja here. So you tried even to answer the question before I asked it that if the, um, the authorities or the departments of the federal um, capital territory or federal capital development authority are doing their jobs. Why is it even a government, federal government owned federal housing authority estates are affected in these latest demolitions? And is it that there were oversight before even federal capital, I mean federal housing authority FHA estates? And um, I will conclude by saying if you take, because I've done about two stories in past two years about unoccupied estates in Abuja, they are very massive, hundreds of thousands everywhere. If the owners build those estates and they are not being occupied, why don't the authorities of uh, FCT allocate it to people like us who do not have anywhere to stay? Thank you. Yeah, Honorable Minister, my name is John Bosco Onyema Abakuru. Uh, we do say our eyes have seen, our ears have heard what Mohammed Welo is doing in FCT. Congratulations, sir. However, we are not good at praise singing. Being a federal capital territory, you have told us all the achievements, the infrastructure, and everything. You didn't say anything about the security of the, of the FCT. We do know that. Uh, at a time ago, a governor you know, raised the alarm that the terrorists are building cells within the FCT. What are you doing to ensure that the FCT is secured? Though I was boxed, I have to stop there because I have three questions, but I have to stop there. Thank you. The Honorable Minister, yes, you respond, yes. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much for, for these questions and also for the... Please, please, can we have silence? For the commendation, which quite frankly goes to my team, not to me, you know, really. Thank you very much. Uh, with regards to the area council elections that took place and the court cases, uh, I want to just emphatically say to my brother from the punch that obviously, for those of you who know me, I follow the rule of law. And uh, this government is a government of rule of law. So you can be rest assured that the FCT administration had nothing to do with the court case at all. Uh, it doesn't make sense for us to superintend over an electoral process that was adjudged very transparent. And we were even commended because during the area council elections, we lost some, we won some. Tell me any area council or local government in Nigeria where the sitting government lost an election there. Tell me. Even if they are, they will be, we can count them in our fingers. That shows you that the FCT administration and by extension, the government of President Muhammad Buhari is law abiding. We allow for free and fair election, and that's exactly what happened. And like in any election, there are those who feel aggrieved. So they went to court, and the court gave a judgment. And uh, as a law abiding uh, uh, government, we, 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 we honor the, the court judgment. And that's a natural thing to do. 
I'm sure it will be unthinkable for me as city minister in the federal government of Nigeria in 2022 to flout a court judgment. It doesn't make sense. So now what we are doing is we are awaiting the outcome of the cases in the court. And at the end of the day, as a law-abiding administration, whatever the court says, we move on. Because the whole idea is elections are over now. And what we, are, we should concentrate is governance. So uh, secondly, uh, Express News. Yes, uncompleted buildings have been a challenge. And with the population explosion and how rent is so expensive here in Abuja, I'm sure all of us uh, know that, which is a reality. Any open space that is ungoverned, available, uh, people go into it. And we've continued to work towards a number of um, uh, a number of ways to solve that. First and foremost, now we have identified the uncompleted buildings, starting from an epicenter, center of the city, in cycles we are moving out. And we've identified the owners of these buildings. And we've communicated in the open media, open source, as well as directly with the owners of these buildings, that uh, they have to you know, start removing them. And invariably, what usually happens is, a person puts up a building and he gives a security man to take care of it. He doesn't probably live in Abuja or he doesn't go there. And before you know it, the security man also sublets it and something. So you know how it goes. But it's something we are working on because we know that on a number of occasions we've been able to identify criminals in some of these houses. Uh, but we do it in a way that uh, with a human face in such a way that, you know, you don't create too much societal upheaval. But it's something else that is ongoing. I'm happy that my brother from Business Day talked about IGR. Well, you see, when I came for this briefing, uh, I was given borders with, you know, that it was just infrastructure. But actually, we've done tremendously well in IGR. As a matter of fact, we are now rated as the second subnational after Lagos in terms of IGR. And all this <laughs> happened because of the good work of the people in all the departments seated here. There are so many of them, I will not be able to name them. But we have a young man now that handles our FCT internal revenue service, Mr. Abdullah. I don't know if he's here. Yes. Uh, so he's, uh, he's been doing a very good job. And what we intend to do, probably before the end of our tenure, is to be number one. And we intend to do so because now we've almost concluded the titling process that we intend to roll out for all the properties in the estates so that uh, we intend to give them title so that if you live in an estate or, you, or even if you live in a building that has flats, you will now be able to have a title document that gives you flexibility when you want to either use the facility uh, for any mortgage loan or if you want to use it to sell. And then it frees the the, uh, the ability to make land transactions because a lot of economic activity is tied to land. And then if you make the titling much easier, uh, it's, 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 it becomes helpful. And uh, I may as well also say that here, uh, under the ease of business, ease, ease of doing business, you know, process of this government, FCT has keyed in very, very closely. And we are rated among, you know, in many of the parameters used in uh, judging uh, subnationals, uh, FCT has come up very high. And I think we've done a lot in trying to ease the land tenor process and, 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 and so on. We, uh, these are, when it comes to exact figures, uh, probably I would not want to commit myself, but I can tell you our IGR now is over 200 billion. Uh, I want to also, I want to, I, I want to thank, I want to thank the correspondent from uh, Prompt News for what what you you've mentioned uh, regarding Apple Road, and maybe I need to I need to put clarify my comment on demolitions in the proper context. What I was saying is that it's unfair for the general public to rate ministers based on destruction of and demolition of property. So that is the main context I said. And I was bashed because I was not uh, demolishing. 
and I told you, distinguished audience, was that I and my team felt that let's empower and, uh, the institutions that were supposed to do all this to make sure that they prevent illegal buildings from even coming up so that you don't need to demolish them. But having said that, of course we demolish, we continue to demolish. As a matter of fact, as we are seated here, a team is demolishing somewhere already today. And these things will continue. Because no matter how you try, there are those who still would not want to follow regulations. But now I think uh, our team have been out there trying to explain to people. And certain demolitions are just almost inevitable. For instance, you have to demolish illegal buildings along waterways because when a flash flood comes, the enormous power of running water during a flash flood is something that most people don't know, but you've seen it. It, it can even raise a motor vehicle with all the weight of the motor vehicle. So what we've done is we need to save lives and that's why we continue to demolish. And when you have to construct a road meant for hundreds of thousands and somebody decides without seeking appropriate approval, decides to go and build on the middle of the road. So are you going to make a detour to in respect of one person to the detriment of hundreds of thousands or are you going to just move it away? So this is it. So it's, it's, it's a fact of life. It's, 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 it's a two-way thing. We try to encourage uh, people to follow the rules and regulations because it's all there. And then, of course, if you, are, you, are follow, you, you go on the wrong side of the law, we, we move on. Because as public officials, we are empowered and we have uh, a duty, as a matter of fact, a moral obligation to do what is right for the largest number of people. And that is what has really always guided me as a public officer. You don't look at individuals, you don't look at class, you don't look at groups, no. You do what is going to be beneficial to the largest number of people, and that's what we've been doing. Uh, unoccupied estates in Abuja is something that arose because to a very large extent, while many people wanted to go into mass housing, I think they didn't do their research properly. Because, for instance, you go and build a duplex in a place that is far from town. You make a six bedrooms, all in suit, in a barrack-like setting. And you expect somebody to go and pay hundreds of millions or at least tens of millions to buy it. So I think the, the, the pricing and the, the thing with the benefit of hindsight has showed that it was very, you know, you know, so that's why most of them were not occupied. Now what we've done is the whole idea of uh, mass housing was that investors will be given land where they will develop houses and provide the internal infrastructure while the FCT administration provides the connecting infrastructure. But the rate at which these houses came up far outstripped the capacity and the financial ability of the administration, ours and the subsequent ones. And that's why part of the bashing I get, especially from those property developers, is that I've been extremely stingy with land allocation. And I felt that it doesn't make sense for us to give you land in an area where we know that it will take 10 to 15 years for us to provide infrastructure. That way people go and take loans, they sell houses to off-takers, some of them in the diaspora, and then you build houses that people are unable to occupy. And then of course, you build, uh, you take a typical Metama Asokoro design and you put it in a satellite town you expect that somebody will move and go and buy it there. So I think now, as time went by, now uh, a lot, you can see now most of the developments are modular. They are terrace-like buildings. And now instead of massive estates, you find that they are, the lands are maybe in manageable lots. 
one hectare, two hectares, five hectares, in areas where there's accessibility. So this is something that, you know, all these things has to evolve with time. City officials learn from their mistakes. Investors learn from their mistakes. And along the line, somehow we will all go and converge. But I believe it will work out fine, eventually. Uh, the gentleman from Vanguard talked about security. I want to tell you, the FCT is the most secure part of Nigeria today. Yes, we have insecurity here and there. It's a reality. And I think it's a phenomenon that affects not just Nigeria, but even our sub-region. But what I do know is that the security agencies in the FCT are doing extremely well. Because for, I always say this, and I will say it here again, for every incident that you read in the papers, or you see on the social media, or you listen in the radio, I tell you 10 to 15 cases have been nipped in the ball, but it's not out there in the public. For instance, we have, through the security agencies, busted several cells of BH, Boko Haram, within the FCT. Certain areas where they were and the kind of businesses they are doing and how they were able to blend easily within the wider community is something that I cannot divulge here. But I tell you, even yesterday, or was it two days ago, a plan was hatched to kidnap two prominent people. But because of modern technology now, and because of the way the security agencies network among themselves, these plans were hatched. When the doctor was murdered in Games Village, there were a lot of issues as to all oh, insecurity and so on. But it was cracked. And it turned out that those that murdered him were those closest to him. Using technology, everybody was trapped. At the time when the Nigerian police were being bashed, we already had information, one or two people already were arrested. But we couldn't divulge that to the general public because you do so, the others that were on their own will know. Eventually that thing was cracked and they were arrested and they are undergoing all the normal processes. The poor lady that was murdered in Metama and her cops dumped, who was the, who had a child, who I think was an NYSC. It was all there in the press. But now it has been cracked. Those who did the murder have been arrested. So all these things happen. So that's why sometimes, that's why I say we need to own the city. We need to love the city. Each time a big headline comes like this, it resonates across the entire world. And they say our beautiful city is under siege. Like all this information now, even if it's divulge it, and it has been divulged. The first incident was on the front pages, was under breaking news, under all the social platforms. But the explanation I gave you now was also in the news, but hidden somewhere where you don't see. So this, are, this is just my appeal to you. So having said that, I want to really tell you that, yes, we have pockets of criminality here and there, but for those of you who lived in, the New, in, 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 in New York, go to the Bronx. <laughs> go to Queens. Those of you who lived in London, like my sister here, go to the other areas. It's everywhere. But if we all organize ourselves and, and, and love the city, and fight for the city. These are all things we are going to fight for. Thank you very much. Okay, on the instruction of uh, Mr. Chairman, we'll take five ladies first, and then with his approval, we'll take the next step. Adesua, Raliat, five ladies first. Adesua, Raliat, Kayla, Juliana, any other lady? Oh, you're a lady, okay? <laughs> <laughs> You're not a lady. What I want to ask a question. I don't know. And then, okay, we have all the ladies. Um, hold on. And then, 
Leon. No, no. We've taken all the ladies and then we have one more slot. Then Leon, please. Thank you. Please, one question. Stick to the facts, please. One question, please. Thank you. a bit on the demolition and I want to ask you, despite the policy, the open door policy, the free hand you have given your uh, members of staff, why does it keep recurring? Do you think there's a level of collusion? Is there a lack of efficient policies or implementation of those policies? Or the absence of prosecution of those who are colliding uh, with the people who put up illegal structures and, you know, cut corners because of the lack of uh, land allocation problems. As a mega city that Abuja is, as any other mega city, there's a peculiar challenge of housing. So this would occur, but how are you, what is the plan to curb it? I really didn't hear that. And why haven't we been able to stop it? And you talked about owning the city. This is not a question. As someone who has recently moved to this city, uh, can I bring to your observation, sir, that some of the traffic lights in Wusetu don't work. And so the, the traffic is chaotic. Uh, it reminds me of what I left in Lagos. Also, uh, there are parts of the city where the traffic, uh, the lights, the street lights don't work at night, so it's very dark. Thank you. Good morning. My name is Raleigh Atadenekon from Classic FM and The Beat. My question is with regards to the Okada menace in the FCT suburbs. Is the FCT planning to uh, ban Okada riders in the territory, uh, uh, just towing the line of Lagos State? And what are you doing about the criminal elements amongst the Okada riders? And also about uh, multiple um, taxation of businesses in the city. Thank you. Uh, good morning, Honorable Minister, dear colleagues. My name is Kayla Megwa from Channels Television. Honorable Minister, I host a program called Dateline Abuja every single week, and uh, residents of a particular area have a question for you. The place is called Durumi 1. Now, what's happened is that there was a demolition at, uh, of some of the shanties, which is very good. Uh, we really commend the FCT authorities for doing that. That really helped a lot uh, with sticking to the plan. However, after the demolitions, a lot of those criminals, because uh, we, we did realize that uh, with the demolitions, a lot of criminals were staying in these shanties. Now, those criminals uh, were unleashed on the people who live in Durumi 1. A lot of them moved into the motor park the Guagualada Motor Park in Durumi 1. And the fact that Durumi 1 does not have any roads and has very poor electricity. The electricity in Durumi 1 has been poor since February. So there has been multiple cases of armed robberies in estates in Durumi 1. And they wanted to ask the FCT minister what, uh, what can be done about that situation. Uh, in, in fairness to you, Honorable Minister, we did follow, go around when the demolitions were happening and none of the people who built those houses were able to present us with a legal document from ages saying, oh, I got this, um, this house legally. You know, we were able to establish that when we followed uh, the, the, of the officials around for the demolitions. But the problem is that these demolitions keep happening. So what is the reason why these buildings keep springing up? Is there something that can be done to ensure that it stops so that the environmental degradation from flooding can actually be ended? Thank you very much. Good morning, Honorable Minister. My name is Juliana Taiwo Balonye of the Sun Newspapers. My question has been asked, so I will just take you on what you said earlier. You did say um, the city administration has set us. A national must. So I would like to know how much that is. And then you did mention 200 uh, million 
is it billion, million or billion igr i like to know is it monthly or annually thank you Good morning, the Honorable Minister. My name is Dr. Leon Sibbe of the Nigerian Tribune. I was able to make it to the hospital and was saved. But there are some other people that experienced the same manner of attack and that didn't make it. But that is not even my point because I've, all they took from me were my phones and uh, I'm here able to talk to you. But there was something I was told by the police that is probably the reason why hoodlums are everywhere in the city. They told me that they go on raids on these people and that tens of people are actually arrested in all these, you know, ungoverned spaces like you have heard and, and noted before. But what happened is that their greatest problem is that when these people are taken to court and they are either detained or jailed, some influential people intervene for them and they are released back to the society and they continue their criminal activities. I do not know whether you are aware of this, that this kind of thing happens with the judiciary. If you are aware, what do you think you can do to ensure that people that should be in jail remain in jail and uh, free the society of their evil uh, intentions? Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you for your questions. Um, we'll just take two questions from our online audience, and uh, we'll round up. And, and, uh, hold, uh, hold on. It's obvious that the Honorable Minister might need to come again, because there are just so many areas that we didn't cover. Mm -hmm. So let's just take just these two. One question is from Frederick Mwabufo. He says, what's the completion time for Apokarishi Road project, and how far has the project come? Is the completion of the project feasible within the tenure of this administration, Apoka, she wrote. Then one more question here from, yes, Neka Aniago. And she says, any hope of getting public water supply in Apo resettlement area? With the rocky terrain in some parts, you cannot even drill a borehole successfully. So those two questions, I think most of those uh, residents are from Apu. And then uh, one more question here. I think um, said, how would farmers in the remote areas access the funds under the projects of the Fadama project? I think that could be handled in the next set of uh, presentation the Honorable Minister would do. We're just concentrating on infrastructure for this particular briefing. Thank you, Honorable Minister. Thank you very much once more for these questions. I want to use the opportunity to welcome our new resident in Abuja, the lady from Arise. All the reasons you, you, you mentioned as to why these infractions continue are in one way or the other correct. You see, change is a process. Uh, some of these things are legacy issues. 
inherited by this administration and even the previous administrations. And all these infractions continue to arise uh, because of the enormity of what is happening, the weaknesses of uh, government institutions, the conspiracy of silence by people within the neighborhoods and all this. But going forward, that's why as an administration we continue to demolish. That's why as, a, as an administration we continue to do advocacy. And that's why as an administration we take people to court. And that's why also we try to, 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 to defend, defend our situation. But really, it's going to be an ongoing process and to such a time when institutions mature and get to do the right thing. And then uh, as time goes on, I'm sure we'll, we'll, we'll get there. Uh, you're right regarding the traffic lights situation and even the street light situation. Traffic light situation is local because it's something we could handle and we're handling. Uh, I'm going to call one or two people just to explain to you what we are doing. Uh, even with respect to the, the street lights. But as you know, power is one of the greatest challenges we face as a country. And the lack of power or insufficient power is something that has weighed us down as a country. But definitely, under the current regime, a lot of effort has been done nationally to be able to see how we can do it. And I think eventually we'll get there. So it's a systemic issue. And as administration, for instance, we could decide to power all the street lights in Abuja with generators and allocate 50% of the FCT budget to do that. But would that make sense? Exactly. So that's the reality. That's why some areas uh, that are prone to, the, I could say some areas that are very important, like the airport expressway, like the Kubo expressway, you find that most of the time lights is on there. And some of the major streets within the business district, we also power them with generators. But this is not sustainable. It's a matter of resource availability and prioritization. And I'm sure residents would rather manage with the darkness, but to make sure that the roads are completed, the hospital system works, and more importantly, there is water. So it's, it's all part of the process of development. And I can tell you, I have a lot of sleepless nights because of the power situation. And just recently, one of your colleague, colleagues in one of the newspapers, as a matter of fact, the Guardian, bashed me. And he bashed me badly. But I'm used to it. You know, so, but I just want understanding that these are issues that really are, are, are very critical, but it's all part of the process of moving on as a nation. Uh, I, I'll just call on the PAMSEC or maybe he would nominate somebody from the Transport Secretariat to tell you what, uh, what we are doing immediately now with respect to traffic lights. No, yeah, traffic lights at, inter and at intersections. Thank you. Members of the high table. Thank you, Your Excellency, the Honorable Minister, the very respected members of the high table. The, our esteemed journalists and distinguished ladies and gentlemen. The traffic light situation has been a cause of concern and worry to us because uh, we need these traffic lights to regulate the flow of, move, of uh, traffic of vehicles on our roads. What have we been doing in this regard? As some of you will observe, and some of you had rightly reported, the commencement of repair works on some of the traffic lights. In the first way, in, in all, currently we have about 172 intersections in the FCT. 33 of these intersections are currently being fixed. 23 have been fully fixed. And that's why as you visit some traffic light now, you see that those ones are working better. We are retrofitting all of them to become solar powered so that we not depend on the electricity supply that has become difficult and challenging to manage. We believe this process that, is grad that has commenced gradually will go on and by, maybe by the end of this uh, fiscal year we will have achieved substantial progress in refixing the traffic light. However, there is a challenge that we also need you to join us in this war against vandalism. As you know, in Abuja, the rate of vandalism is higher than 
any other place. Electric post, street lights that are standing, because of outage, they go there, they remove even five inches of cables. And once you cut this cable, the, the a long stretch of light supply will be affected. Some of these things happen in the presence of all of us, but we pass as if we are not concerned. But when the night comes and the brunt is brought on us, we now shout that there is no light. So that is where we also need you as the watchdog to help us in our effort to provide security for this. Let us all go with the slogan that when you see something, say something. And as the Honorable Minister has said, we need to own the city. Any investment in the city are all our resources. And if we allow them to be frittered away or vandalized, it's, it, it, it hurts all of us. Look at it, for instance, just in the, by the tower, Twin Tower, close to the NMPC mega station. This year, we have replaced the Manco hole cover there seven times in a particular spot. And they keep coming, removing. These are not angels. They are humans that are doing this. So you should also use your, the power of the pen and your visibility to support the FCT in providing this. We are working on various options to address the issue of the power supply, as the Honorable Minister revealed. That we, we are currently looking at investing in other hybrid power sources so that in the long run, we'll be able to generate electricity sufficient to run the city. But for now, we have to make do with what we have because that is the best we have in this circumstance. Thank you, Your Excellency. Thank, uh, thank you very much. Uh, added to, to that, I think the, uh, Madam Riley has also mentioned about uh, Okada. I would like to call upon uh, Dr. Abdul Latif, uh, who is seated over there, the director of the, our Department of Road Transport uh, Services, to just speak a little bit on Okada. Because Okada has now become a, a social menace and a criminal menace. <clears throat> not only in the FCT. As you know, okay. within the central business district and even the city center itself, we have, uh, we have um, uh, banned Okada. But I will, he will just explain to you what we are doing and all the efforts regarding that aspect. Thank you. With due respect to the existing protocol, uh, you will recall that in 2006, my name is Dr. Bello Ablatif. You will recall that in 2006, the Okada as a means of transport in the FCT was banned, especially in FCC. But however, the regulation of Okada in the Federal Capital Territory has been a major you know, obstacle and a major, a very difficult uh, issue because the effect of Okada in the FCT is multifaceted. It's not just traffic violation is a means of facilitating criminal activities in the FCT. It's equally alleged that Okada is used as a means of, you know, uh, delivering drug uh, trafficking in the FCT as well. It's again, it's been also established that some of the Okada riders are non-Nigerians. So if you look at these multifaceted issues, I think it requires multi-sectorial approach 
to deal with the issue of uh, the menace of Akada in the FCT. However, we have introduced some various, uh, you know, reg reg regulatory mechanisms, you know, to deal with the menace. One is that we are introducing, you know, the issue of uh, rider certification for those who may be using Okada, particularly for dispatch activities. The engagement has started and the training has equally started because until you are certified by the Directorate of uh, Traffic uh, Services, DRTS, it will be impossible in the next few months for you to use or ride motorcycle in the FCT. Again, we are scaling up the type of um, motorcycle that can be used in the federal capital city. Particularly, if it's not above 200 cc, which has the requisite strength to, to withstand the use on highway, definitely you will not be allowed to use that. And then we are remodeling the licensing and certification as well. These are some of the newly introduced regulations that in the next few months we will be you know, carrying out in the FCT to dissuade the use of uh, Okada. However, in some quarters, the issue of uh, total ban has been suggested. And then why I think is something for the administration to think about is that already some of the state contiguous to FCT are already banning. So, and if we don't put it in our front burner to consider whether to review the, 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 the use of Okada in FCT, variably in the next few years, FCT will be a dumping ground, and then the management of Okada will be overwhelming. But in our own case, we are trying our best, and I feel that dealing with the menace of Okada should be looked at from a multi-sectorial approach. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much. We'll now go to the question by uh, our sister from Channels. I want to commend you actually for your program Deadline Abuja. It has been very educative for, for me and quite a number of us here also because you give us first-hand feedback as to what the people out there feel about it. Uh, you mentioned about the issue of robbery, uh, which also I think... Uh, one other person mentioned. The thing is that urban crime is a phenomena that is quite pervasive and uh, sometimes has to do with the fact that, you know, people, especially security agencies, downplay it, thinking that it is not uh, um, very important. But urban crimes, using knives, and you know, handbag snatching, uh, f cell phone snatches, it's, it's something that is, I agree with you, is worrisome. And out of a number of cases, some people get attacked like uh, you've seen. So what we do is we try to encourage additional surveillance, uh, police activity, and then in intelligence gathering. And that, to a large extent, we've been able to make some reasonable headway. For instance, in the last few years, it used to be one chance. But you know now one chance has reduced substantially because of a lot of efforts done in terms of stop and search, in terms of checking them. And now what we are now trying to do is, especially within the city center, we've realized that some of these urban crimes occur at junctions, intersections. Uh, if you notice, in some of the intersections, we had to remove the uh, traffic barriers. In some previous administration, put some bumps before some of these intersections. And as you approach the bumps, you have to slow down. When you slow down, these street urchins, you know, attack you. And this is a continuous thing, and that involves also removing them off the streets. Every week, within the city and within the suburbs, 
the police arrest no less than 25, 30, 40 people, even last night. Because every day, the first thing I do at 6 a.m. is to check my, my, my tablet device and I get what we call CTREP. For those of you who are, you know, aware of the security nomenclature. And it shows me all what has happened. How many people have been mugged, how many people have been arrested, what attacks have been done. And so it's an ongoing thing. But as population increases, unfortunately, crime and criminality also increases. It's a natural socio, social phenomena, sociological phenomena. What governments do everywhere the world over is just to try to be ahead of them. And I, I really apologize uh, to you and any other person who has been uh, 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 attacked in the past. Durumi is one area that shouldn't have happened the way it is. And if you notice, within the Abuja metropolis, there are two districts that are well relatively populated for which no infrastructure work has commenced. That's Mabushi and Durumi. And I had always asked, how come you establish districts within the center and you don't give contracts to, to do it. And that's one of the reasons when I, 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 we came in, I, I said, no, we're not going to open new districts until we complete existing in districts. It was a tall order, and I must say I've not been able to succeed. But now with the new road we are doing that is going to cross uh, Namdi Azukwe and go into Idurumi district, I think we'll try to see what is possible. But the reality is, madam, within the remaining less than 12 months, there's not much that can be done in some of these things, but we'll initiate a process that others will come and continue. But I must really publicly uh, thank you for your deadline on uh, Abuja. It's quite educative. Uh, I think uh, the gentleman from Son wanted to know how much we are paying for the repair a lady, uh, the Christian Center and the, and the National Mosque. I think this information, I don't think, will add any value. The most important is that these places uh, are public, are owned by the, the, the general public, and they are edifices that we feel very proud of. And as a, an administration, we are giving them token support to make sure that these places are. And to be frank with you, offhead, these are financial issues, you know, that I offered, you know, I don't want to give you a wrong figure so that you will. Uh, quote me and catch me next time. Uh, regarding Apokarshi, I've spoken so much about it, but I'm very happy the director of Southern Town Development Authority, Comrade Obin Nash, here in the audience. I don't know, Comrade, if you can update us on uh, this Apokarshi road. Good afternoon, Your Excellency. I'm Comrade Obina Okwebu, coordinator of Satellite Towns Development Department. The Apokarishi Road is a road that is very dear to this administration. That road is like when a doctor goes into a theater. You have a, you have a diagnosis, but what you see is different. Now, we hated that project, and um, it was at the inception, wrongly priced, and um, as the job progressed, it had very difficult features, which we battled, the engineers of the STDD battled with the contractor, and we came to the same page. But as time went on, we know the issue of um, the recession and um, the effects of COVID, and today, a quarter that was signed having diesel at 240 naira per liter cannot continue with diesel being sold at 800 naira. So right now, we are making progress on Apple share about 64% completed. We are reviewing the contract rates, which is a process, a process that goes from Moss to His Excellency to FEC and comes back to us. But Apple Karishi is very, very key to the FCT, to, to Nassau State, and um, is a road that can take 
get someone moved from city center to the fringes in like five to ten minutes. And His Excellency, the minister, has continued to stress. In fact, most times he wakes me up at midnight and asks me about Abu Karachi. And contractor is on site. We are working. But as to the time of completion, is these are we are dealing with issues that goes with the economy, but substantially before the end of this administration, there's a possibility that we will make solid milestones, if not to complete it. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, I think we have a, please, please, can we, uh, we have another two questions remaining, which I will quickly answer. But uh, to be fair to the audience, I, uh, on the issue of the National Mosque and the Christian Center and the Durumi districts, uh, the Director of Public Building is here and also the Executive Secretary of the FCDA is here. I think let's hear from either the FCDA or the, uh, you know, yes, thank you. Now. Okay, let me, okay. Um, thank you very much, sir. Um, actually, regarding the Durumi and Mabushi districts, um, the issue with the two districts, along with three other districts of Katampe, Kado, and Gwarimpa 1 district, and Gwarimpa 1, that is life camp where we have the official resident of the minister. Is, uh, these are districts that have been uh, slated for development, the infrastructure development through public-private partnership arrangement. It was approved by FEC, um, that is Federal Executive Council, way back in 2006, uh, which Katempe to be taken off as the pilot scheme. And uh, the issues with Katempe did not allow for taking up the other distri uh, districts uh, for the same vein. And um, we are trying to make a case, and uh, we have a position to present to the Honorable Minister to first have to seek for the withdrawal of the effect approval that they be implemented through PPP. Then we can look for other um, uh, source of uh, uh, funding it. Uh, and I think this current uh, private sector collaboration, which is not necessarily the model which is being adopted on Katampe, might be looked into. I think that is about the Durumi and Mabushi district. So for until we get this lifted, we'll have to continue with this. We are doing some temporary um, uh, extension of assets and other works within the district as they will be directed or requested by when, when the need arises. And that is one area that uh, the minister said we are going to do through Durumi. It's a station of actually Moshut Abiola uh, way that is uh, from area one roundabout through to Kaura district. We are working on that and uh, hopefully when we conclude the procurement we'll do that uh, road uh, very soon. That is about that. Then the issue of the national uh, mosque and the national Christian center. Um, maybe Director of Public Building can confirm that there were votes made for the uh, renovation of these two places of worship, as has been explained by the Minister. About 500 million naira each was uh, voted by the FCT administration. And we got through the interface with the two uh, management of the National Mocks on one part and the Christian Center on the other part to collaborate to see what is currently going on in the two uh, locations which you see. I think it is about it. Thank you, sir. Uh, I think the final question has to do with water supply in Apo. Okay. Uh, Okay, we'll get, we'll get there. One thing is that uh, with IJR, I can tell you that we have now in our database 
uh, is the executive secret I mean executive chairman of uh, FCT IRS around here okay somehow we missed bringing him in so we have a robust database of over a million residents uh, I will confirm when I go back to the office that all of you are included. If not, we'll make sure. <laughs> so basically, quite frankly, basically we are working on robust uh, IGR, uh, you know, but the figures I mentioned to you actually are in billions. Uh, and also the annual, you know, annual. I mean, we've not reached a point where we, we, we have 200 billion per, per per month, but we are taking off uh, about 200 billion plus uh, per annum, uh, out of which uh, basically, as you know, our funding is the, our IGR, and then uh, allocation from the federal budget, and then what we get also from the uh, federation account, which allows us to get as FCT 1% of the um, federal, federal, uh, uh, funds accruable to the federal government. But the point I was just trying to say is that uh, the bulk of our funding that we now use to run the territory actually comes from IGR. While in the formative years of the FCT, it used to be from federal allocations. But now what we get, our budget, taking into account our budget for 2021, for instance, which was about 300 billion, you find that the portion we get from the federal government was just about 50 billion. So you can find that it's not even up to 25%. So really the bulk of what we use now to run the territories from IGR. And going forward with our widening of the tax net, which I just mentioned to you, and also our efforts in terms of improving on land, land titling. Uh, these are all areas that is going to really beef up our our IGR. And we have no option but to do that because or else we really cannot be able to, to run the city and even to continue to build on infrastructure. So finally, I will just go to the question that was raised with regards to water supply to Apple. Uh, I will call upon the uh, Executive Secretary, FCDA, to just say one or two words on that and then maybe I will round up. Thank you. Thank you, Your Excellency. Um, the Honorable Minister had actually given a, a rendition regarding this greater Abuja water supply. Uh, without being too immodest, I was whispering with the special advisor of media. Uh, the Minister was so modest with the number of districts that will have been uh, serviced by this contract on the greater Abuja water supply. Actually, before now, before the coming of this administration and the award of this greater Abuja water supply, only seven districts of the first one, with about three others on temporary basis within the first two, that is making about ten, that were being uh, provided by portable water from Lower Usu, Madam. With this uh, greater Abuja water supply on completion, we are targeting to provide about 33 more districts within phase two and three, phases two and three of the city. This will bring to a total of about 42 districts or so that will have been properly provided with portable water supply, including a station into uh, industrial um, zones of IDU, institutional area, and um, uh, ATV. This is a colossal listen, and the upper resettle, uh, resettlement side is now being looked at as one of the fringes of the city. It's no longer looked, uh, being viewed as a, a satellite settlement. So there are efforts because one of the tank, which is supposed to feed in one of the loops, which is the distribution loop, which the minister said are not the reticulation are not in place. This contract is actually providing the reticulation within this uh, uh, area to cover these 33 districts. The apple is housing one of the uh, special tanks. And one of the instructions of the Honorable Minister, just as we are done with Ushapo, where one of the, where a main line is passing through a community or they are housing that, we should try and find a way to uh, provide water to that. And we have seen that we can use water from tank five when we come to reticulate 
through the loops of Tang 5 to also feed in Apple. And uh, this is already on in part of this work that uh, the greater Abuja water supply will come to play. Meanwhile, they are continuing to inform, we're discouraging that sinking of borehole uh, within the Apple settlement. But since there is no any other means for now, uh, as soon as we come to with the distribution loop, this will be severed. That is the position. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. Uh, somehow I missed out the question by Dr. Leon of Tribune, so I'll go back to it. He wanted to he wanted us to speak about the release of criminals. Well, quite frankly, I am not aware that when street uh, urchins and you know all these people that do these street crimes are arrested, you know people seek for their release. I'm not aware. But more importantly, and this is where citizen monitoring and engagement comes in. Uh, I think if situations like this arise, it's very important for people to, to speak out, identify those influential people that try to pervert the, the, the just, justice, because that's the only way we can really sanitize our society. But going forward, the reality is uh, that the cr criminal justice system has challenges, as you know. As a matter of fact, uh, when we arrest most of these people, even the Al-Qaeda riders, and uh, even those that violate traffic lights, uh, when you go to these, the, the criminal system, I mean the, the court system, sometimes they are given fines because even if you want to jail them, Abuja is serviced by three jails, the one in Kuje, the one in Suleja, and the one in Kefi. And all of them are filled to the brim. So at the end of the day, really, so where do you take them to? So that's why sometimes the system is such that you have no option but just to give them fines. And uh, these fines are easily paid. So going forward, already the, the FCT administration, since uh, this matter come, I will tell you, allocated land to the Nigerian Correctional Services in uh, Karshi, where I think it's quite a huge expanse of land, and I think they are now in the process. They've almost completed, I believe, or in the process of constructing uh, a medium security correctional center there, which will reduce the gap. But now when, when uh, criminals are convicted in Abuja courts, we have to take them to Suleja, and some we have to take them to Kefi, simply because if you want to take them, you, you don't take them to... Kuja is filled up. And we have now worked also towards, with the judiciary, creating what we call a bustle center where you, you keep uh, criminals, or rather you keep youth below the age of 18 so that you handle it. So it's, 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 all, it's a whole systemic issue that has to do with the entire criminal justice system. But I do really want to encourage uh, members of the public that when situations like this arise, and then, uh, you know, you hear that some influential people are, are going to the court system to influence the release of people. Please shout and we'll support you. Personally, I feel that whoever goes there to, to even seek for bail should also be arrested, quite frankly. So, so that's my feeling. So having, uh, at this note, uh, I, I want to uh, really sympathize with all those who, for one, any reason, have been attacked by some of these crimes. And maybe in closing, I want to just use this opportunity to extend my sincere appreciation uh, to the senior special assistant uh, uh, on media, to Mr. President, and of course, Mr. Uche Ozurumba and his very team, important team in the presidential communication team, and all of you in the audience for having really given me an opportunity to say a little bit of what we have been doing. And I do hope that now your assessment of the administration of the FCT and maybe my team also will probably change a little bit. But I really want to tell you that I enjoyed this session and I thank you very much. And I look forward to be invited uh, maybe earlier than later. Thank you very much. Well, uh, to end this conversation, let me begin by, you know, we have our Igbo brothers have a proverb. 
they say, they say that you don't just dress up the masquerade and take it to the market square. It has to dance very well at home before you go to... I think this is what you are dealing with. This, these amazing accomplishments rendered by the minister. Very... Very enriching, very exciting, very informative. I know, and why now? Because he's not a showman. He's not. He's a silent achiever, and I'm qualified to tell you this. He's one year my junior in college. <laughs> and and. And one year senior in age. So one year my my senior in age, but that's that's. <laughs> <laughs> hey. But let me say that even in college, you know, he, he had always attained excellent grades and he was, he was never pompous or arrogant. So, so that's the way it is. So the action speaks for the man. Uh, and that's, uh, that's the quality uh, of which he is made. And I congratulate you on this excellent presentation. It's, it, it's really first class. And I want to say that deliberately, uh, our colleagues, uh, Oge in particular, who leads uh, the strategic communications uh, uh, process in the villa, this is about infrastructure. We, we don't say it's open to all of the things that the minister has been, has been doing. Look at how he has taken us through a tremendous journey, you know, dealing with the COVID, for instance. A journey that started with anxiety and it ended with reassurance. I, I would say that's a story for another day. I'm sure we'll be talking about health, about education in FCT and all of the other things. The schedules, so usually this program is set out in a way to say, this is infrastructure month. And he should have come along with the Governor Fashola and the others, but he was missing from. So this is the way it is. There will be time, all of those who wanted to ask those questions, there will be time for the minister to come and address all of the salient issues that he's dealing with in federal capital territory. So uh, I want to say thank you again for doing it so, so in a first class manner. And this is appreciated. And I want to say, just talk about the two takeaways. One, the minister said, own the city, love the city. And I have always known that a journalist loved Abuja and they have always owned it. I'm not sure I've seen a journalist who came to work in Abuja for five years and they transferred him or her back to Lagos and they did resign that job. <laughs> I'm an example also. I came in and I said, you're a journalist. And here I am, and I know this is true with most of our colleagues. So how do we make journalists to even love the city more? I know the minister has done enormously while helping journalists in particular to find settlement and permanent living in the federal capital territory. <laughs> he has... He, he, yes. Okay, guys. Okay. Okay, thank you for this. Okay, okay, please. Yes. Thank you for this wonderful appreciation. And I was going to say before Dr. Leon, that actually this is a minister who said he had inherited a city of nine districts. And he's bringing that up to 33 
districts. That's, that's, that's a huge development. And, and I'm sure that the minister is already thinking, you know that Ogun State has a journalist village? Lagos has a journalist village, even Cyprus, far away. And I'm sure that one day, even if he doesn't complete it, you will hear of a journalist village in Abuja. <laughs> and, and, and in which case, we will not have to follow. I don't know whether Harry is a communist. <laughs> Harry, if you enter someone's house without his permission, they will jail you. <laughs> Simply, you know, UK, other countries have laws. Possession is ownership. We don't have that. Maybe you go and lobby National Assembly to change their law. <laughs> anyway, so thank you, gentlemen. It's been a very exciting session. Uh, the, the minister is accompanied by um, Adishola, Mr. Olusha Adishola, a very pleasant and accessible administrator, the, the permanent secretary. Uh, Bashir Mubarnu, he's the uh, chief of staff. Also, very accessible people. Injana Shehu Ahmed, the FCDA general manager. And uh, as a matter of fact, he's accompanied by the largest delegation we have received so far. About, uh, so it's not for me to go through all of the names, but we'll acknowledge quite a number of them. Uh, Mr. Adamu Jibril, the director of land. Uh, Dr. Jalo, director of AGS. Uh, Damisa, I believe he's one of us, the, the director of uh, MD of uh, broadcasting. We also have uh, Perpetua Homa, that's uh, the lady on that uh, side, director of settlement and compensation. Uh, and and uh, where is Atta? <laughs> no, what I want to say is. Atta has, Atta has committed, he has committed class suicide. <laughs> I thought he had committed class suicide. <laughs> and thank you, Minister, for your Atta. We appreciate this. Thank you. Yes, sir. So, uh, all of you, uh, and I want to thank members of the Presidential Communications uh, team and others who are working with us here. Ibrahim Diko, uh, Director of Operations in the Office of Chief of Staff, who is SSC Admin, Colonel Felix. On the other end of the table, Oge, who is the lynch person actually for this project, we thank you for this. Uh, Loretta, the digital person, Uche, who is the anchor. And to finally say, and we have always said this, that uh, without uh, you being there for us, the journalists, as correspondents, as reporters, nobody will even reckon with this forum. I believe that today, this is perhaps the most efficient forum for any public official to use. And, and we thank you for this, and we hope you will do extremely, extreme justice to what uh, the, the Minister of FCT has done today. Thank you very much. We appreciate all of the officials. Thank you. Well done. Thank you. Okay, Okay, Thank you very much. So, thank you for your support always. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate it. Thank you. 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 Thank